It's so nice to be with you today. I'm so grateful that you've all joined us for this session. Thank you to Deb and Russ at Future Church for inviting me and for hosting these important conversations. I recognize some of your names and some of your faces, so it's really nice to be with you. And um, I know many of you are probably also NCR readers, so thank you for that as well. Um, I'm thinking today I'll keep it kind of simple, um, kind of walk through this document a little bit. I know it's only been available so far in Italian, so many people haven't been able to kind of interrogate the document itself. And I know that's something very important to do and to understand what Pope Francis is trying to do. Um, so I thought in my head there might be four kind of steps to this. The first thought I had was to talk about the process of creating this document, how, how it's been in motion for nine years. I'd then like to speak about some of the four biggest kind of thematic changes that I see. Uh, and then I'd like to look at some of the mission statements about the Department of the Vatican themselves. And then we'll end with some open questions I have. Um, I really like to keep this kind of dialogical conversational. So I'll keep my remarks maybe to 10 or 15 minutes to leave for plenty of time for people to ask questions or raise up other concerns. Uh, just a note, I'm in an office where the heater here is like an airplane when it turns on. So if it sounds like I'm taking off, it's because the heater turned on. It's not that I'm going anywhere. Um, so the first part of this about the origins of the project. Um, I think in order to understand this document that, that reorganizes the Vatican's bureaucracy for the first time in a really substantial way in about 30 years since Pope John Paul II did his reorganization in 1988, uh, I think the real way to think about this is to think about what the church was like in February 2013, um, when uh, the, the cardinals in Rome met, met after the resignation of Pope Benedict to consider who would be the next person to become the Bishop of Rome, the next person to become Pope and to lead the global Catholic church. Uh, it's hard to remember the feeling of the church back then, but there were, there were so many scandals occurring. I mean, the, the papal butler had been arrested for leaking documents. Uh, there was lots of worry about the Vatican finances. It seemed that every year or two, there would be a huge scandal, questions about where hundreds of millions or billions of dollars had gone and what was going on at the center of the church hierarchy. Into this, the cardinals come to Rome uh, to face the fact that for the first time in 600 years, the Pope had decided to resign. It wasn't quite clear to everyone why Benedict had decided to resign. He hadn't given a ton of reasons other than his own declining health and his own sense that it was no longer his turn to lead the church after eight years as Pope. And the Cardinals come to Rome and before they enter the conclave, they have these meetings that are called general congregations where essentially they all come together. They're not yet under the seal of the conclave. So it's not quite secret yet, but they're starting, they're getting ready for that process and they're all, there's a, basically a freedom of conversation. They each get different amounts of time to speak in terms of what they're hoping, how they see the church going, what's going on in the moment, what needs to be addressed. And by all accounts, the, the, the person who spoke most movingly and most attracted the most interest almost immediately was this Argentine Cardinal, Jorge Mario Bergoglio who apparently gave, according to accounts related to me and to others by several of the cardinals in the room, gave a very short talk, very focused on evangelization and focused on the church going out. And he said that in this moment in church history, Jesus is standing at the church door knocking to be let out, to be let out of the church, to be let out back into, to be let back out onto the people and, and with the people and on the streets. And I think in that speech, which we don't have an accounting of, of course, other than in the cardinals who were there and, and remembering the event, we see kind of the entire mission of this papacy nine years on and, and in everything that the Pope has done, that this Pope named Francis has done, which is to try and let Jesus out, to be the church on the street, to be the church that gets, that, that he would later say in his interview with America Magazine, that isn't afraid to get bruised and bloody and preferences going out to meet people where they are. And I think it's important to remember that because as we look at this document, we're, we're thinking about the person who wrote it, the Pope, 
who is directing this change and what he has in mind. Um, so part of that process then, when Francis is finally elected, one of the first things he does within the first couple of weeks is he appoints a council of cardinals, a group of, at the time, I think it was originally six cardinals who would advise him on reforming the Vatican. It wasn't clear yet what that project would be. I remember at the, at the beginning, um, there was a lot of expectation in Rome that they would do it in a month. You know, the cardinals would come to Rome, they'd have a meeting with, with Francis, and you know, within a month or six months, we'd have this new agenda. It was really crazy. The first couple of meetings of the Council of Cardinals, uh, you know, journals from around the world came in. It was hundreds of journalists coming in thinking, this is gonna happen quickly, we have to cover it. And of course, that's not how the church works. This Council of Cardinals would go on to meet every two or three months for essentially nine years. They would be working on a draft of a document, which would become an apostolic constitution. Uh, and the first leaks of the document really wouldn't even leak until 2019. So two and a half years ago, uh, when I got my hands on a copy of that document that was circulating among some of the bishops in Rome, and we wrote about it at National Catholic Reporter then, we actually had the help of uh, theologian Rick Gaiardi, who kind of looked at some of the themes in that document. But that was in 2019. And apparently in the two and a half years since, that draft uh, has circulated, I think, thousands of times among the bishops' conferences, among bishops in Rome, among each of the departments of the Vatican, among canon lawyers, among theologians. And apparently there was a really enormous sounding of people for input for on, uh, kind of, I think for buy-in to say, this is what we're looking at doing. You know, what should we be looking at and what should we be changing? So finally in March, we, we do get the document. It's released kind of surprisingly. Um, we knew that it was coming, uh, that it would likely come this year, but there was no, uh, no announcement of its coming. It just happened on a Saturday, March 19th, the Feast of St. Joseph. It only came out in Italian, despite that earlier drafts had also been in other languages uh, and they had been pre-vetted in those languages. I had seen drafts also in English. Uh, and the document that results is, as Deb said, called Predicate and Evangelium, which is literally preach the gospel, go forth and preach the gospel. It has, 11 chapters over 54 pages, which when you think about organizing basically the entire government of a city state, which the Vatican is, is a fairly short document. Um, again, signed on March 19th. It only has 31 footnotes. Again, for a document of this kind, not that many. Something I find interesting there is that every single footnote except for one is either from the Vatican Council or later. There's only one footnote earlier, and that's a reference to Vatican I. That's kind of the bare bones of the process. The four big thematic changes that I see in this document, the first is that given its name, Preach the Gospel, evangelization is clearly stressed as the primary focus of the Vatican and of the church's entire mission. We see this particularly in how the document orders the listing of the different Vatican departments. The first department remains the Secretariat of State, which has always been kind of the super department at the Vatican in charge of both internal church matters and also how the church at, or the Vatican interacts with foreign governments or foreign entities. But immediately below that entity is the new dicastery for evangelization. So this dicastery is now technically under the leadership of the Pope. He is the direct leader of this office. Uh, and what, what's interesting to me and, and has been interesting for years is that this new dicastery for evangelization is even listed above the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which had been traditionally beyond the Secretary of State, the most powerful congregation in the Vatican. It's the former office of the Inquisition it's the office charged with um, kind of safeguarding or watchdogging Catholic theology across the world. 
uh, and you may be aware of many of the controversies in that regard in recent years. But Francis has made clear that before that task of doctrine or of safeguarding and, and, and policing Catholic doctrine, the first task is evangelization. The second themat thematic theme I think is most important to highlight is that this constitution clearly states that lay people, both men and women, can lead Vatican offices. It states, you know, essentially they can be delegated power by the Pope to steer those offices in his name. This is frankly pretty massive. Uh, the text says that, quote, any member of the faithful can preside over a dicastery, end quote. The earlier constitution in 1988 from John Paul II specifically said that offices were to be headed by cardinal prefects or archbishops. So there's no, there's no not clarity here. The Pope is very clear, lay people can lead Vatican offices. Beyond that, Francis makes clear that lay people have a role in the governance of the entire church. And I highlight here paragraph 10 of the document, quote, the Pope, the bishops, and the other ordained ministers are not the only evangelizers in the church. In the updating of the church, one cannot take into account, one cannot not take into account the involvement of lay men and lay women, even in roles of governance and responsibility. There's an interesting point there in the Italian as well, in that, you know, in Italian, it's in a Romance language. So you can say the, the, the plural male form for lay person, and that includes everyone. But in the document, they're very clear to use the plural male and the plural feminine to say lay men and lay women specifically. So lay men and lay women are supposed to have roles of governance and responsibility in the church. Uh, Jesuit Father Tom Rees, writing in an RNS column shortly after the publication of this document, said of the, the clarification that lay people can lead Vatican dicasteries, he said, quote, this could have monumental impact if truly implemented. Theoretically, the Secretary of State, the highest official after the Pope, could be a lay woman. A woman theologian could be prefect of the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith. This will upset those who believe that only the ordained can exercise the power of governance in the church, end quote. The third theme I'd, 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 I'd like to highlight is a focus in the document on collaboration and what the Pope calls co-responsibility. And this is very circular. It's between the Pope and his Vatican officials, between those Vatican officials and local bishops, between bishops and lay people, between lay people and all of those other categories. Um, and there's a continued push in this document toward decentralization and towards empowering local bishops conferences. The constitution says it wants to promote a quote, spirit of healthy decentralization, end quote, to maximize the roles in which local dioceses and conferences can uh, execute their work. It clarifies that all personnel in the Vatican serve first and foremost to quote, further the mission of the Roman pontiff and of the bishops in their respective responsibilities toward the universal church. This service must be animated and carried out with the highest sense of collaboration, co-responsibility and respect for the competence of others, end quote. I find that quite interesting. I know it sounds kind of like a basic thing to say, especially for an American mindset, but I can't tell you how many times I've spoken with bishops at the Vatican who have said, they will come to meetings at the Vatican and feel that they're not listened to or not heard or their concerns are off or they're put into meetings where they don't really have a chance to say what they wanna say or they're more being talked to rather than talked with. And so I think that there, that, that service statement about what, what it means to be a Vatican official and to respect the competence of those who come to into your office actually is quite, revolutionary. And the fourth and, and final theme I'd raise up is Vatican II, Vatican II, Vatican II. 
The document makes so many references to the Second Vatican Council. It's clearly the touchstone for how Francis considers the work of the church in this era and how he wants Vatican offices to be operating. And to kind of highlight that, I thought I would walk through four of the dicasteries. Um, and what's interesting to me is that at several points in the document, when the Pope, he, he basically gives an outline for what each office at the Vatican should be doing and how it should work. And before he gets into the nitty gritty on that in all of the di dicasteries, there's some sort of summary of the work of the dicastery, almost like a mission statement inside the document for each of the offices. And I found those really enlightening in terms of what the Pope is hoping will result from this change and where things might be going. So for example, in the what had been the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and has now become a, the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, the Pope writes, quote, the work of this Dicastery is to help the Roman Pontifex and the bishops in announcing the gospel in all the parts of the world, promoting and caring for the integrity of Catholic doctrine on faith and morals, drawing from the deposit of the faith and looking again at it, always with a deeper intelligence before new questions, end quote. So in that mission statement, we see even in doctrine, there's a focus on evangelization and there's a focus on understanding new questions emerging in new times and how those might lead to other questions in terms of what our doctrine is saying. And there's a further mission there about the work of the Dicastric for the Doctrine of the Faith with theologians. The, the mission statement says that this dicastery should, quote, favor and support the study and reflection on the understanding of faith and customs and of the development of theology in diverse cultures in the light of doctrine and the challenges of the times. Uh, and that quote, it goes on to say that the dicastery can examine the writings and opinions of those that would appear contrary or dangerous to the faith, but quote, always searching of dialogue with their authors and presenting them suitable rem remedies, end quote. This has been you know, a key criticism of theologians in the decades since the council, that the congregation of the doctrine of the faith could bring them in for whatever, you know, whatever doctrinal irregularities they might see in their work. And there was always been a lot of question in terms of if they were treated fairly, what the mindset of the dicastery was in evaluating that work, and what chance those theologians would have to defend themselves. And in fact, I think that the language the the Pope uses here in terms of dialoguing with theologians is quite interesting. Uh, the previous constitution, John Paul II's constitution, as theologian Rick Gaiardi has noted, only said theologians could be called in to defend their work. So there's a switch from an automatic presumption of some sort of need of defense to a more open-ended work of dialogue, of trying to meet each other and understand where both parties are coming from. The second dicastery I thought to look at is the dicastery for the divine worship and the discipline of the sacraments. This is the dicastery basically that oversees Catholic liturgy around the world. And I thought this mission statement could not be clear about what the Pope wants liturgy to look like. He says that th the mission of this dicastery is quote, to promote the sacred liturgy according to the renewal undertaken by the Second Vatican Council, end quote. The council is the guiding post for Catholic liturgy since 1965. And Pope Francis has made this crystal clear in the document and then to the dicastery that has this task. There were two other dicasteries I thought to talk about very briefly. One is the dicastery for the promotion of Christian unity, which is responsible for dialogue with other Christian denominations. The Pope writes, quote, it is the work of this dicastery to realize the teachings of the Second Vatican Council 
and of the post conciliar magisterium concerning ecumenism, end quote. Again, very clear. Second Vatican Council is a touch point. Work towards ecumenical dialogue is a touch point, no questions. And the, the last dicastery I thought to highlight was the dicastery for interreligious dialogue, which is responsible for dialogue with non Christian believers and non Christian traditions. And this is a decency to this here. The Pope says, quote, the dicastery works so that dialogue with believers of other religions are conducted with an attitude of listening, esteem, and respect, end quote. It's kind of a basic three part mission that is very just decent and you can understand what the Pope is telling the dicastery to do and to work with other pe peoples of other faiths openly and honestly and not with any sort of presumptions. So I'll, I'll move to my kind of two open questions and then we can have our discussion and I'd love to hear your thoughts and questions. Uh, the first major question I have is about the Pontifical Commission for the Protection of Minors, with, with, which Deb mentioned in her opening. So the Pope created that in 2014 to advise him on clergy sexual abuse. Uh, it had been kind of a, an independent institution with not a clear status in terms of what it was other than an advisory body to the Pope. In earlier drafts of this constitution, uh, it was to be given an, a, a full independent standing inside the Vatican bureaucracy, but on its own. And in earlier drafts, it was to be called, quote, an independent institution connected to the Holy See with an advisory function at the service of the Holy Father, end quote. And that's not what happened in this constitution. In this constitution, it is placed inside the dicaster for the doctrine of the faith. It continues to be its own entity but an entity inside the Dicaster for the Doctrine of the Faith. It will be continued to be led by Cardinal Sean O'Malley of Boston, who has praised this move, putting it inside the Dicaster, saying it will make the commission, commission a fundamental part of the structure of the church's central government. But however, you know, I think abuse advocates and former members of the commission have questioned you know, why, it, why it has been treated this way. Marie Collins, who is a former member of the commission, an Irish abuse survivor, who resigned in 2017 over frustration about how the commission was or wasn't working with Vatican officials, told me that she considered this the nail in the coffin for the group's credibility. Um, obviously, Marie has her own background in working with the commission uh, and her own opinions, but there are, I think it's a real question in terms of what, how will the commission work from here you know, being inside this dicastery, will they be able to speak openly about what they think needs to happen in terms of protecting minors in the church? Or will this lead to more kind of bureaucratic silencing? The answer I think is a little open. We have to see how they handle it from here. And my, my other open question is a much bigger one. Um, I think there's a lot of grandiose, even beautiful language about the work of the church at the Vatican the work of the various dicasteries. I wonder kind of if the day-to-day -day work in these departments will live up to those outlines. You know, the Pope has set a really high barometer, I think, for where he wants kind of attitudes to be. But there's a lot of question to me in terms of the day-to-day -day just in our office atmosphere, if that will be how it is, if the officials in those dicasteries will have mechanisms to, to make sure they're meeting those goals. Uh, I think we'll see some of that beginning in June. The new constitution goes into effect on June 5th. Uh, so you go to bed on June 4th as the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and you wake up as June 5th as the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, and I think the other big question here is around June 5th, will we finally see women appointed to lead departments at the Vatican? We've seen several appointments of women in undersecretary or second or third in command roles under Pope Francis. We've not yet seen a woman lead a department. It's clear in this constitution that they are 100% capable of doing that. It's up to the Pope to decide, you know, to make those appointments and decide who will lead them. 
And for me, that's a very big open question in terms of what we see on June 5th. Do we see you know, a roster of new appointments, including a, at least a few women leading various Vatican departments? So again, uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm grateful to be with you. I'm happy to take questions. And if you ever want to know more about what's going on at the Vatican, I, I, I urge you to read National Catholic Reporter. We have some of the best coverage uh, in the English language. Okay, great. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, that is a very, very um, wonderful, succinct overview of what's going on. And, and uh, I was very interested in what you had to say. Um, so what I'm going to do is open it up for questions. So just so you know, Russ isn't here today. So you either have to hold your hand up or use the little uh, reaction button that's, uh, you know, that you can put your hand up with that. And uh, then I'll be able to call on you. If you put something in the chat room, I may not see it because I'm just not as good as he is about looking at all these different things. So uh, please raise your hand in one way or another and ask your questions. So the one, one thing uh, that I wanted to start with, someone sent a question uh, prior to this coming on. And I guess it's the question that skeptics have, uh, Joshua, is, is this just a reorganizing of the, of the chairs <laughs> On the Titanic, you know, it's the it's the skeptics' uh, question about another reform that we have we raise our hopes around, and you know, and uh, you know, and it just doesn't happen. So I guess I'll just let that be the lead question, and let everybody else get ready for theirs. Well, I think it's always fair to kind of interrogate a reform like this and to see. Uh, where it might go, I think it's quite clear that Francis has felt that he was given a mandate by the cardinals who elected him in 2013 to try and reform the Vatican. And obviously the Vatican is a government. It's, it's a, it's a self-governing institution. It has to have rules for how it governs itself and how it interacts with, with foreign governments and then with you know, Catholics around the world. And so Francis has made it quite clear in this document how he wants this institution to be interacting with Catholics, what goals he wants them to be prioritizing. And <coughs> the priorities for the church in this century. And so I think from here we see how it functions. On June 5th, it goes into law or it goes into effect. Um, we see what appointments are made to lead these new dicasteries, how those people are putting the reforms in place or not. And then we report on that or we kind of follow up as best we can. Do you, um, do you think there's any chance that Francis will put a woman into his evangelization dicastery uh, at the top? Yeah, so that new dicastery for evangelization is technically led by the Pope. It has two sections, one of which basically it merges two previous offices, one of which is currently led by the Filipino Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle. I don't think anyone expects that to change. He's only been in Rome a couple of years. The other is currently led by an Italian archbishop named Salvatore Fisichella. I don't know. Um, I think it's possible, again, according to the Constitution, it's possible that any office could be led by a woman. I don't know if Francis is thinking that would be one of them, but it's it's made clear in the Constitution that that's possible. Okay, great. Elsie, you have a question. Elsie Romano. I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, where would we be able to find the document in English? Is it available now? The answer to that question is it is not yet officially available in English. Okay. Uh, at NCR, we've had a number of reports that get into it kind of in depth. Um, you could also go to the Vatican website and, and get the Italian and <laughs> find a friend. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, uh, you mentioned that the, the uh, Pope uh, appointed a Council of Cardinals several years ago. Do you get a sense from who he appointed how the 
council will be um, ecumenical, how it will be global. Do you, do you get a certain sense of that just from who he appointed? Yeah, the Council of Cardinals was really appointed with a specific goal, which was the creation of this constitution to reform the Vatican bureaucracy. So at this point, I wonder if it will be given a new role, if it will be kind of more stabilized in terms of what it's supposed to be doing now that this constitution has been written and the Pope has come up with this plan for the reorganization of the Vatican Curia. It's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's an advisory body. So it's cardinals who are brought to Rome to basically advise the Pope on governing the church. So they do kind of what the Pope wants them to do. It's currently led by a Honduran, uh, Cardinal Marandiaga Rodriguez. Um, but he is going to be turning 80 at the end of the year, which is the mandatory retirement age. So I'm not sure uh, what Francis is thinking in terms of who might be the next coordinator of the Council of Cardinals. Okay. And one more question I had when you were discussing um, the thematic changes, the collaboration and co-responsibility, it still sounded like it was a top-down um, way of doing things. Uh, um, do you have that same feeling? When you said that the Pope would, would, would have discussion with the ones under and then it kept going, it wasn't, it, it, it just didn't seem like much different from, um, uh, you know, how do I put it? It just seemed like it was still from the top down to me. Yeah, I mean, the Vatican is a very hierarchical place. Um, yeah. So bishops and cardinals traditionally have been in charge of the various offices. Um, that has changed, I mean, in terms of the attitudes, that has changed dramatically. In the time I was in Rome, I was in Rome for seven years. Um, but there are still that, that is still kind of embedded in the system. Yeah. And so I wonder if how that will change, especially if lay people start being appointed as heads of dicasteries or departments, if that might lead to some wider cultural changes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elsie. So Maureen, you have a question. Uh, first of all, this sounds like it's been written by a mature Christian adult, which is very encouraging. And secondly, it also sounds very threatening to the current Vatican hierarchy, who will be frightened by all of these changes. So, and the third question, uh, question may is, how secure is this constitution? Francis dies, a new Pope comes in, and he says, remember what Francis said, forget about it. Thank you. Well, I don't think anything Pope Francis does is secure in that regard. I mean, the Pope is an absolute monarch, essentially. Um, but he has laid a lot of groundwork here. This is an apostolic constitution. It is signed. It will go into effect on June 5th. I mean, the last of its type was written in 1988 and stayed in, in, in function for more than 30 years. So I would be surprised if uh, uh, the next pope were to try to undertake a similar project. This took nine years. It took a lot of people's time and energy. I mean, certainly a, a future pope could have a different emphasis or want to stress different points. And we could see a future pope, you know, tweak the document or tweak uh, individual departments in terms of what they should be doing. I think that would be quite normal and, and certainly, you know, something Benedict and Francis have done with John Paul II's document before this document came out. But I, I don't think we would see a new constitution like this, barring anything really unexpected. Thank you, thank you. So Jane Aubrey, uh, you have a... Yeah, uh, my question basically is about how the international and worldwide synod fits into this whole process. It almost seems as though it might've been good to get that feedback before the, this final constitution was promulgated. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think, so the Pope had issued a previous document, I think, was it four years ago now? A separate document reforming the Synod itself. <coughs> so, oh, bless you. So Thank the, you. <laughs> so the Synod has an office in Rome or at the Vatican. I call it kind of the Vatican office of the Synod, but it is not technically an organism of the Vatican bureaucracy. It is a separate entity created by Paul VI uh, to allow for bishops to come to Rome, to have meetings and to have what is known as a Synod. So it does not fit into this document specifically in that it is not technically a Vatican institution. It is its own thing. So there's a separate document uh, Episcopalis Communio, which governs the Synod and how it should function, how Synods in Rome should be held. Uh, my sense in terms of why the Pope had this document released before the next Synod, which is ongoing right now at the local level, but will meet in Rome in 2023, it's just time. It's been nine years since this document's been in motion. I don't think there was a sense that the Pope wanted to wait any longer. He obviously had a draft uh, two and a half years ago, which they were relatively happy with. And they've done hundreds, if not thousands of consultations since then on that draft. And I think he was ready to just sign and move on. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Robert, you have a question. Hi, Josh, thank you so much. Um, the this first one, you may have already said this, but what is the difference between a dicastery and a congregation? I think I might have missed that. And then, well, we'll go maybe on that one, then I have one more. But... There really isn't a difference. So basically what the Pope has done is he's gotten wrong, he's gotten rid of a lot of confusing terminology. So the word congregation is basically gone. The word pontifical council is basically gone. So everything becomes a dicastery. A dicastery is just a word that means department or office. It comes from Greek. They could have easily called it the Department for Evangelization. Uh, I think they decided not to, honestly, just to have a bit of a difference in terms of the, a secular institution versus a church institution. So the, the, there, are no more con there are no more congregations, there are no mon more pontifical councils. There's a secretary, uh, secretary of state all the dicasteries and a couple of other secretariats and that's it okay and uh the other thank you and the other one uh in terms of like the giving more power to the bishops conferences like how i guess i don't fully understand what that means or I, and i'm thinking along the lines of like like uh, uh a lot of the local bishops uh have been putting out like statements to the secondary schools i teach high school and like you know about uh trying to uh, clamp down on gender theory and all this stuff and like and i know there was a vatican document that came on that came out on that a couple of years ago so like do, now do they have more leeway to like do these kinds of things to like say restrict what can go on in the schools or the parishes like uh they have more power to do that or something or i don't i don't know like uh, what, what is the how are they empowered and it could be bad i feel like <laughs> so this is something the pope has spoken about his entire papacy. In the first interview he gave with America Magazine in 2013, he talked about a desire for a healthy decentralization in the church. He's never been super clear about what that will look like. He's talked about wanting to empower bishops conferences, which is quite different than the way Pope Benedict and Pope John Paul II spoke about bishops conferences and kind of wanted to centralize more power in the Vatican. Um, there's been a couple instances where the Pope has done this officially. One is on liturgical translations. So four or five years ago, the Pope changed the, the officially changed how liturgical translations will be brought about in the church, um, giving the bishops conferences more power kind of to approve those translations without the Vatican say so. Um, but on the on the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty of life in the US or life in Canada or life wherever, um, bishops conferences at this point have not been given more authority. Um, nothing has changed really all that much, but there's a, kind of a, an overarching mission or view that 
this pope wants there to be more for bishops conferences to do and wants more matters to be handled on the local level okay thank you thanks robert rita Houlihan, you're next in line Rita, you'll need to you. unmute oh i'm sorry sorry i said I said, thank you, uh, Deb and Josh, it's good to see you again. Um, so um, my core question is on the, uh, uh, the Commission for the Protection of Minors. And um, I'm, because I've drew a long um, investigation and reporting, what do you think? Do you think it really um, would have strengthened it to be um, a, a separate entity with, or would that have made it more vulnerable? Um, you know. Again, are they very dependent then on whoever is the head of the dicastery that is going to be, you know, I guess housed in? So that's my basic question. It's a big question for a basic question. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of questions. I mean, as a reporter, I don't, I'm careful about what I say in terms of what I think. Um, I know that there is a lot of pain um, from former members of the commission in terms of how the group has evolved. Uh, Marie Collins and others have spoken about how they kind of were hoping for a body that was much more advisory and much more policy making, especially in terms of making recommendations to the Pope about things that need to change, particularly in the area of accountability and in making sure that bishops who have covered up or brought to justice uh, and making sure that that can't happen in the future. Um, I know that current members of the commission would say a lot of that work is being done, but it's being done kind of quietly. And also with respect to kind of Vatican processes, obviously Marie Collins and others thought it was taking too long and they felt like they were being stonewalled. Um, the current members would might also talk, point to the work the commission is doing in education in, in, in kind of working with different institutes all around the world to teach particularly clerics what safeguarding looks like, the norms that should be followed, you know, the basic standards in terms of making sure minors and vulnerable persons are safe. But obviously, I think obviously there was a tension that emerged there between you know groups on the commission who wanted a more policy making body dealing with mm -hmm. kind of nuts and bolts uh, issues in terms of how to concretize things that needed to change and other persons on the commission who wanted a body that was more educational or more about safeguarding mm -hmm. um, and i don't know if that's finished or if one side has won or not but clearly, you know, being inside the Vatican, you know, I think would limit what commission members might be able to say. That being said, one of the newest members of the commission is, was appointed by the Pope uh, Juan Carlos Cruz, who is a Chilean abuse survivor, who no one can say, you know, has any sort of compunction about saying what needs to be said. So I think there's a lot to be seen yet in terms of further reforms of the commission and how it will kind of reinvent itself in this new function or new new schema. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Rita. Sue Trinka, you have a question. Yes, thank you, Josh. Um, so I have a sort of kind of a two part question. Uh, one, how do you see this impacting our local parishes, our diocese or archdiocese? Uh, and do you see that this kind of new vision is uh, strong enough for lay men and women to use in developing um, strategies for use in their parishes in uh, all the areas that the Pope has mentioned. And the second part of my question is, do you see, uh, I, I always kind of look for what might be ahead. I'm, I'm wondering if there's anything in uh, canon law that uh, sort of goes against what this constitution is laying out for us. 
and can that because that could be used against it. <laughs> so uh, thank you for your comments, Josh. Yeah. Well, to your first point about what it means in local parishes or local dioceses, I, I think the biggest thing is the clear statement that men, laymen and laywomen can lead governing offices in the Vatican and should share co-responsibility in the church. So I think, you know, obviously in the U.S., we already have quite, quite firm examples of lay women serving in dioceses, you know, even as chancellors or as vicars in some instances. In other parts of the world, that isn't so true. Uh, and even in parts of the U.S. where, you know, archbishops might have a different view of the church than a, a more pre-Vatican II view. I mean, the fact is the Pope has said women can lead Vatican dicasteries. And if he puts it in motion and names a woman ahead of a Vatican dicastery, you know, I don't see how a bishop in the US can say he can't appoint a woman a chancellor or he can't appoint a woman to lead, you know, whatever office. Um, that's what the Pope is doing. The Pope has said, he, you can clearly do this. In fact, he's saying not only that we can clearly do it, we should do it. There is an obligation to co-responsibility in the church. So I think the kind of the model setting on that regard is not insignificant and could be quite important, not only in the US, but in other parts of the world. In terms of the canon law question, I don't know, I'm not a canon lawyer. I know that this was passed by a lot of canon lawyers. It was passed by the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts. That's, that's their job. Um, and so I, I, I don't know, you know, the Pope has signed it. He's putting it into motion. It's it's how it is. I mean, in, in terms of the church, that's how that works. Uh, obviously, there could be some questions to quibble over, and you know, or maybe there might be some 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 arguments to be made in terms of why this dicastery, why the word was, why a word was phrased this way or that way. But you know, the Pope has made very clear how he feels about doctors of the law, so it's it's quite clear, I think. Thank you, Sue. So we have Bonnie Stang, you have a question. There's a lot of good things that, that you know, are being promoted here. And I think uh, the issue that comes up for me is that uh, trust was so broken between the lay people and the hierarchy. So now when I see these things like the sexual abuse, if, if their comments, and get through to that dicastery and the uh, openness and the response time-wise could make a big difference on restoring some of that trust. The same thing with women being appointed to those lead per, uh, positions. How long is it going to take? I mean, 50% of our church is women. And yet we, we in the past, we've not had those opportunities and, uh, you know, acting on it in a timely fashion could do a lot again to uh, restore trust and to move things ahead, particularly in evangelism, because up to this point, uh, I think in a lot of uh, parishes, it's been the women who have run the education programs and, and been the ones that reach out. So uh, I'm excited by what I hear, but as I say, a lot will depend upon how fast we can see some of these things be reported. And I, I do understand to a point on the priests uh, and with the, uh, the cover up and a lot of those things that they have been working quietly, but sometimes it would be helpful for, uh, for the laity to know that it is being worked on, maybe not specifically, but it's being worked on and uh, that they're not trying to hide it, it that it's moving forward. Uh, it's, 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 it's time that collegiality and uh, communications from the bottom up are being acted on from Vatican II. And that's what I see in what's coming out here now is trying to restore those communications. 
thanks for your comment. I'm not sure there's much for me to add. I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the, the, the break of trust, but I, I think the church moves very slowly. It took them nine years to come up with this document. It's quite interesting. I think it moves forward on several fronts, but I don't know how long, but you know, some of the changes we're looking for or people are looking for could take a long time. Thanks, well, Melanie. Good question. Nadia, the Catholic Church has never been accused of being a democracy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Janice, you have a question. Yes, Josh, thank you very much. Um, and Deb, too. My question is about what is Pope Francis thinking about as far as moving or revitalizing and reinterpreting the documents of Vatican II that he so strongly wants to, to do, um, such as um, making them a requirement in the seminaries for all these younger priests to really read and thoroughly go through them because there's so much more that needs to be mined from them. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the kind of the academic requirements at seminaries. A lot of that would fall under the new dicastery for culture and education uh, or the dicastery for clergy. Uh, I, I think a lot of that is dealt with on the local level. So it's up to the individual bishop in terms of what seminary they're using and what requirements they want from that seminary. So in the US, that would be, that would depend, that could depend quite quite enormously from diocese to diocese. Thanks, Janice. Colm, you have a question. Thanks, Deb, and thanks, Joshua. Enjoyed your talk. Good summary. Um, I'm, I'm one of the skeptics. Um, I'm not at all happy with, with what's happening. I definitely see it as the deck chairs on the Titanic. After nine years, hey, and this is all you can come up with, oh, I'm very, very disappointed. Um, I would have hoped for a lot more in that time. Um, my key question would be, do you see this constitution, and it is only for the Curia, having any effect on the German synodal path? Because for me at the moment, the German synodal path is the best show in town regarding bringing about change and reform top down. Uh, I, I've long given up on that, and I, I, I'm now focusing at uh, uh, trying to get to the inverted pyramid by being the church, being the church we want to see, and working from the grassroots. But I had hoped there might be some opportunity from some changes from the top down. I don't see any even little glimmers in this document that would give any uh, succor to the Germans in what it is that they're doing. And they seem to me to be tackling it in a very systemic, proper, uh, theologically sound basis. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I hear what you're saying in terms of trying to put the German synodal process on the same, you know, put it side by side with this document. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of thoughts to consider is, you know, this document has been in function or in drafting for much longer than the synodal path has been. You know, I think the synodal path started two or three years ago. Um, so this was already well on its way. So I don't think there was really any sort of reference for that in terms of what they were preparing. And it, this document doesn't really get in the way of any, you know, any synodal gathering, either on a local level or on a national level, bringing forth its own proposals or, you know, bringing them even to the synod. Uh, this is pretty clearly just about how the Vatican is structured. So I don't know that, I mean, obviously it's not as progressive or as forward looking as some of the German proposals have been, but it doesn't preclude them having those conversations and then bringing them to Rome in some form. Thanks, Colm. Um, so it is one o'clock, folks. I'm going to take one more question, uh, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. And if you have other questions, you can send them to me at Deb Rose at Future Church, and we will make sure that we, uh, uh, you know, send them on to Josh and see if he can answer them. So Mary, you you get the last question here today. Thank you. Uh, I too am looking for 
leads or openings for cultural adaptation and especially for training of priests. Um, so do we have to go a long ways before that's going to show up in, in uh, reality? I mean, if you're talking about kind of enculturized, enculturing the, the liturgy, I, I think the document is quite clear that that's something that the, the, the dicaster for the discipline of the liturgy and the worship of the sacraments is tasked with doing. Um, so it doesn't preclude that. Um, I can actually, I had a quote from that actually. Yeah, the one quote from them on that is that the dicaster should quote, collaborate with diocesan bishops so that cultural exp expressions of pious exercises of the Christian people may conform incrementally with the norms of the church in harmony with the sacred liturgy, end quote. And, and we have had that and, and I'm sure continuing, but I'm looking for where we're going to have any impact on priest, well, selection of women, but preparation, um, preparation of priests so that they are leaders of communities. and not just functionaries. You're using Pope Francis language there. That is something he has said that he does not want priests to be functionaries. So I think a lot of that again will be at the local level in terms of how bishops are, what candidates for priesthood bishops are looking to and possibly ordaining, how they're being trained at seminaries and how they're being taught to approach um, you know, lay people and these questions of enculturalization. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so uh, this is going to end our wonderful uh, hour together. I want to really thank you, Joshua, for not only just today, but all you've done in your time at the National Catholic Reporter. Your, uh, your reporting has helped a lot of us to really get insight into what's actually happening in the church. And it's been, been very, very important to future church and to all of us to follow you. Uh, we're really uh, glad that you came to talk about this document. We know that, you know, there's a lot writing on it, but, uh, and we don't know how to exactly it will unfold, but certainly it offers brand new opportunities that I think we can look at and really call the church to follow its, uh, its own lead on this. So I'm going to unmute everyone to, so you can say goodbye. Uh, and so you can unmute yourself. And uh, if you want to give Josh a hand and tell him thank you. And uh, thank you to, uh, to all of you also for just uh, the wonderful questions you've had today. So um, go ahead and unmute yourself and say goodbye. <laughs>